Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. It's uh, great to uh, see everyone on the screen, and it's great that we can gather together, uh, even if it is over Zoom, uh, to worship our God and to praise his name. Uh, on this Father's Day, I think it's great for us to gather, uh, especially as a church, because we have our Heavenly Father, uh, who has given us new life in Christ, and, and uh, he is the ultimate father of our lives, isn't he? That uh, he has called us to be his children. And the benefit of being his children is infinite. There's no limit uh, to the benefits we receive in Christ because God is our heavenly father. So why don't we come before our heavenly father right now uh, and bless his name and praise his name. And as we do sing about God, maybe even think about our own fathers as well uh, and, and the benefit and the blessings that they have been to, our, uh, to us as well. But let's focus our thoughts uh, on, on our Heavenly Father as we sing praises to him. Let's sing our first song. What a great song that was. Uh, it speaks about uh, what the benefit of Christ's uh, reason is for us. And, and the Old Testament speaks the same for us as well. So why don't we uh, read from 100, Psalm 116 uh, that speaks of the benefit that Christ won for us, that the grace that God has given to us. Uh, so let me read from Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother, mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the, of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Isn't our God amazing that he has freed us so that we can serve him? He has given us new life in Christ, and therefore we can stand in his courts, in his, in his midst, and praise his name. So why don't we come before God in prayer as we consider our God, our heavenly father, who has given us all these blessings in Christ. So let's pray to God. Heavenly father, thank you so much for what you have done for us. Thank you so much for who you are and how your grace has transformed us from objects of wrath to be your children, to be your adopted children. Thank you, Lord, so much that when we could do nothing, you did everything for us. For you freed us from our chains. You have rescued us and lifted us up from the, from the Murray clay. That we who were steeped in sin can come before you in your holy presence and be able to be bold and courageous, to be stand, able to stand before you in knowledge that you loved us, in knowledge and confidence that you have forgiven us in Christ. Thank you so much that you have called us to be your children, that we are not orphans anymore, but we have you as our Heavenly Father who guides us and teaches us and disciplines us and blesses us in every moment of our lives. What wonderful grace it is to know you as our Father and to be able to call on you in times of trouble, to be able to uh, shout out your name, to ask you to hear our prayers. Lord, that is such a special privilege, and we are thankful and grateful to you for that. 
But Lord, we also come before you now contrite and humbled because of the sins that we have committed in the past week. We come before you acknowledging the, the failures and, and the sins and the temptation that we fell into. We bring before you our confession of all the things that we have done wrong. We ask you to forgive us and to change us. But we also come before you bold because you have promised to forgive us, not because of what we can offer, but because of Christ, because he has paid it all on the cross, because of his death on the cross, we are confident and assured that you will forgive. And so, Lord, we pray that as we confess our sins to you and as we are assured of your forgiveness, help us, Lord, by your spirit and your word to change us and mold us so that we may be more godly day by day, that our lives will be marked by a progression in holiness and righteousness, that we will seek to do what is good in your sight, that we will let go of our past and not return to it. But help us look forward to the day when we will be perfect, perfected in Christ, when we will have a perfect body, the resurrected body, and therefore we will no longer be tempted by sin, but we will be able to glorify you just as you have called us to be. And so Lord, as we look forward to that day, and as we continue to struggle in this day, we praise your name for all the things that you give us to strengthen us and encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, it's time for announcements. Um, uh, there's only a couple of announcements to make. Uh, I don't think, uh, first thing is this uh, lockdown probably will continue until October, so sometime in October, I think. Uh, some, some reports suggest maybe even to Christmas, but uh, hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, so as we look forward to the day that this lockdown finishes, I just continue to pray for each other, continue to encourage each other, whether, whether it is by calling or, or by text or even email, uh, just keep tabs on each other as we uh, look forward to gathering together uh, as the body of Christ physically. Um, so until the lockdown finishes, we'll continue in this format of um, coming together over Zoom. Uh, that includes the um, Bible studies and other fellowship groups as well. Uh, and just to remind you, there's the um, uh, Women's Circle group uh, meeting that has started last Wednesday. Uh, today we'll be uh, uh, having a rest because it is Father's Day. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the reason that we won't be meeting today, but the meeting will continue on on Wednesday and Sundays at 1 to 2 p.m. over Zoom. So if you don't know the details on how to join that meeting, uh, let me know and, and I'll pass you the information uh, to that. Um, this week, uh, the Bible study will continue as normal on Tuesday and Wednesday. So uh, please join us on, on Tuesday and Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. over Zoom. If you haven't joined before, uh, please um, be free. Uh, feel free to join us at any time. Uh, you know, there's no obligation. Uh, just join in. And it's, it's a great time of sharing God's word. Uh, we, we go very slow in, uh, through the letter of Hebrews uh, as we consider the word and the impact that it has on us. Uh, and so it's a good time of discussion, a good time of encouragement to consider what faith is all about. So if that's what you want to do, uh, you know, don't feel shy that we haven't joined before. Just rock up and you'll be more than welcome to come and join us. Uh, so that's all the announcements I have to make. Um, I don't believe there's any other announcements to make. Um, so that's the case. Uh, it's time for our kids talk and uh, Ron is gonna give us a kids talk. Thanks, Ron. Morning, kids. Today is about um, the word of God. And in Hebrews um, chapter one, verses one to four, it tells us that Jesus is the word of God. I'll just, just read a couple of verses to start off with. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Now, it's, a, it's appropriate, um, children, that it's Father's Day, and I'm, I'm sure you probably um, gave cards or gifts to your fathers and um, we're all I'm a father but we have a heavenly father God the father who sent his son to die for our sins and he's called the word of God now you were all once babies and um, you, you're still pretty young and um, as your parents can tell you and as you would know that when you were born 
you didn't come with an instruction book, uh, which would have been very handy. You have to make it, we, have, we as parents, we make it up as we go along and we try to, try to do our best, but sometimes we mess up. But as your parents um, being believers, being Christians, they know that we have an instruction book and the instruction book is um, the written word, which is, I guess, Jesus, Jesus' life, Jesus in writing, which is called the Bible. And um, this, is, this is one of mine. I call mine, I've got mine, I call, it's back the front here, I call it the owner's manual because God, God is our owner. And this has all the instructions that we need to lead good, godly lives and to know God's will for us. Now, I'll show you, this is, see this here. All right. <laughs> Wheel just fell off. That's, that's, a, that's a model truck I built about 30 years ago. And I, but I wouldn't have known how to build it because it came in a box with lots, lots of parts, lots of bits and pieces. And I wouldn't have a clue. But it came with it came with instructions. And by following the instructions. I was able to put it together. And I guess um, God's word, the Bible, is a bit like that. But in many ways, it's better because in God's instruction book, the Bible, um, not only does it tell us to how to lead lives and to, to lead our lives and to lead our best lives, and God knows that as we live our lives, we mess up, which God calls sin, and we mess up often. Sometimes, you know, we mess up a lot. Sometimes we mess up a little, but we do sin and we make mistakes. Now, the good thing about the Bible is God's instruction book is that it not only tells us how to lead godly lives, but it recognises that when we do mess up, it shows us how to get fixed. And God, to go back to God, confess our sins and God, God fixes us. So it's very important, children. Listen to your parents. Um, love your mother and your father, and especially on, on today, Father's Day, be, th be thankful that you have godly fathers. But um, follow their instruction, and just as they do, make sure, children, that you, you read your Bibles and that you can lead, you can have the best life. And then when you do uh, make mistakes and mess up, you can go to God and he'll fix you up again. Okay? All right, let's, um, let's just give God thanks and, and give our Father thanks for, for blessing us and giving us good, good parents and giving us his instructions. What a uh, great Father, we're very, very thankful for this day. Thank you for every day, but especially on this day, Father's Day, we thank you that you are our Father, that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, um, to, to save us from our sins and to show us the way to live and that he is your word, Father. And we thank you that, for giving us your word in writing and please help us to follow your word and to live um, happy and godly lives. We thank you, Father, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just, as, uh, uh, just as the honest manual, uh, the Bible, uh, it tells us many things, it also tells us to pray to God uh, and, uh, and to bring all our requests to him. Uh, so it's good for us to come together as God's people to pray together, and uh, Ibrahim is going to lead us in prayer. Uh, and after that, he will uh, go straight into reading the Bible uh, as well. So um, uh, over to you, Ibrahim. Pray. Uh, I've got a couple of verses to share. It's about the prayer. In Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7, the prophet says this uh, on behalf of God. God is saying this to the prophet and the prophet is saying it. I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest to tell until that he established Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. And I thought a lot about that God put watchmen and he commanded them never be silent today and night. 
until God answers. And these verses just encourage us to be persistent in our prayers. We pray continuously and we pray persistently. And, and that's what we really uh, need to do. Uh, please try today, after the service, spend a few minutes just reading over these verses. This is taken from Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. It is quite an encouragement for us. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this special time when we come together and call you, and to call you Abba Father. As we celebrate Father's Day today, we really learn what does it mean to be Father from you, Lord, because you are the, the real and the true Father as, um, as uh, Ron shared today. You taught us how to be slow to anger and um, abounding in love and the compassion. You showed us really how to, to love and to forgive. Lord, we uh, come together today to pray for the things we um, happening in our lives. And Lord, we, we, uh, we pray earnestly and Lord, today I ask you, please, to help me and my brothers and sisters here today, listening to me, to be persistent in our prayers, to be um, serious in our prayers. Lord, we can be lethargic and um, we are not serious in our prayers prayer time. Lord, we pray that we be more serious and pray with, uh, um, with um, longing and pray with persistence and pray with urgency. So Lord, we put the requests we have today before you today and we know that you are the only one we can trust to intervene in all these needs. Lord, we bring it before you today, Mari. We heard that she's been transferred to Minchinbury Hospital. She's still sick. Lord, we thank you for her life. She's been um, a role model for all of us, the people who know her. She's been faithful. She's been um, trusting you despite all the trials and temptations in her life. She went through very harsh time, yet she's been faithful all these years. So Lord, we pray in your name, Lord, that you may be with her and make her mindful of you and lighten her burdens and her suffering. And Lord, we, we pray for healing and uh, just uh, make her feel your presence uh, with her. Lord, we bring before you our youth and our children and their leaders, the teachers of the Sunday school and also the leaders of the youth group. Lord, we pray for our young people that you may protect them, guide them, lead them in such really uh, confused and the dark world we live in at the moment. So Lord, we pray for them that you'll be with them and, and watch over them, Lord. We also pray that they would love you and be excited about uh, your word and that they may be able to invite their friends to youth, to the youth group. Uh, also, we pray for the, the children of the Sunday school that you uh, give them, Lord, to um, be excited about the time uh, where uh, and the Sunday school usually it is held and um, and Lord we pray for the leaders or the teachers that you give them excitement about the word of God 
and give them wisdom how to deliver it to the children. Lord, we also bring before you our state as um, we really still suffer from this surge of uh, COVID-19. Lord, we, we bring that before you today. We, bring, we pray for mercy. And we pray also, Lord, for cooperation from, uh, from the public that they respond to uh, the, uh, uh, the health warnings and uh, advices we hear all the time in the media. Lord, we pray, pray for the, um, our premier and the government that you granted them wisdom to handle the situation as it is now. Lord, we pray for the sick with COVID. There is so many people suffering at the moment. They are in hundreds and thousands. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you be with them, heal them, uh, be with, the, with, with their uh, relatives, uh, the loved ones around them, and give them, give them uh, courage to uh, call upon you, particularly at this very difficult situation. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, as we just read in the book of Psalms, that you, you listen to our prayers. You love us because we are your children. You always give us a listening ear, and we thank you for that. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I, uh, I read the, uh, the passage Damien going to preach from today, which is in Luke, sorry, Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six. And I am reading from verse uh, 15 to the end of the chapter. That's Romans chapter 6 from verse 15. And Apostle Paul is saying this. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey, to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Verse 19. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to over increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death, but now, that you have been set free from sin and they have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, please keep your Bibles open to uh, open on that uh, passage. Uh, and uh, let's pray to God before we uh, look at the passage. Let's, so let's come before God in prayer to ask him for wisdom uh, to understand his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word and how it teaches us uh, 
what it means to be your children, what it means to be your servants and slaves uh, of righteousness. So Lord, as we look at this passage this morning, we pray for your wisdom, we pray for your spirit to teach us and guide us so that we may understand correctly and apply them in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you have ever been to an Australian beach, you would know the dangers uh, that lurks beneath the surface. So if someone has been caught in a rip at the beach and has been washed out to the sea, and if they couldn't swim back by themselves, what do you think they will be thinking at that time? If they're um, pulled out to the sea where they can't swim back because of the tide, what would they be thinking? What would they be hoping for? The only thing they could hope for is someone to come and rescue them. Because on their own, what, would, what, what can they expect? On their own, they're as good as dead because if, um, by their own power, by their own strength, they can't make it back to the beach, to the safety of land. Because pretty soon they will get tired. And when you're tired in the open sea, what happens? You can no longer float. And that is the end of that. So when a lifesaver comes to the rescue, when, when someone comes to rescue you uh, on a surfboard, on a boat, or on a jet, uh, a, a, imagine the relief the person would feel when they are rescued. And as they way, make their way back to the beach, imagine how grateful that person would be for the rescue. And, and once safely back on the beach, what would you expect that person, that person who has been rescued, to do? What would you, would, what would you expect them to do? Thanking the lifesaver would be the least of, uh, of, uh, of the things that you would expect them to do. But if they were to stay at the beach for the rest of the day, what would you expect the person who has been rescued to do from then on? At the very least, you will expect them to swim between the flags, to keep to the rules of safety, that they will no longer put themselves in danger anymore. And in the long run, maybe if they want to come back to the beach, they will learn how to swim better or even to swim out of the rip to rescue themselves. But what do you think the lifesaver would say if this person who has been rescued goes back to the same spot where he was pulled out to the sea, where he got caught in the rip? If they go back to, the, to make the same mistake they made the first time, what would the lifesaver think? It would be foolish for this person to jump back in the same water and repeat the same mistake. And in a similar way, we have been rescued by our Lord Jesus. He has set us free from a bondage to sin. So now that we are free, what kind of life should we be? What kind of life should we live? In verse 15, Paul poses a hypothetical question on whether our freedom from sin means we can now sin without any consequence. That's basically the essential nature of that verse 15. If we are no longer under the condemnation of the law, then aren't we free to do what we want? Because the nature of the law was told us, don't do that, don't do that, do that, was limiting us in what we can do. But if we are free from that, if you are free from, from the condemnation of, of the law and sin, then aren't we free to do whatever we want? And Paul answers that question by saying, it is foolish to think like that. For freedom from sin, when you're freed from sin, does not mean that you are free to sin. Rather, freedom from sin is to be free to serve God. And to illustrate this point, Paul uses the human example of slavery to show why it is foolish to think we are free to do whatever we want. And in verse 16, Paul gives us a definition of what it means to be a slave. Whoever you offer yourselves to serve or to submit is the one you have to obey as a slave. Ultimately, the question isn't, this question in verse 15 isn't about whether we are free to sin or not. The question really comes down to asking, who is our master? Who is your master? Who is my master? 
who are we obedient to? Who we submit to is the answer to what, whether we can sin or not. If we are asking ourselves, can we sin? Are we allowed to sin or not? Then we need to ask ourselves, who is our master? Who do we belong to? Who do we submit to? Who are we obeying? Is the question we should be answering before we answer that question. And Paul gives only two alternatives to this. For the Bible is clear that either you are for God or against him. There's no sitting on the fence on this, which means there can be only two masters over humanity, over you and me. There is only two masters ever. The first is sin. And the second is God. But the problem Paul has shown in Romans is that no one submits to God on their own. By default, everyone is born a sinner. Why? Because we are all descendants of Adam. And that's what we saw last week. If you are a son of Adam or if you're a daughter of Adam, if, you're a, if you are a child of Adam, then you can, you can only sin by the fact that he was the first man to sin. So even from birth, we are slaves to sin. That's who we are. And that is what we were before Jesus rescued us. As Paul points out in verses 17 and 20, we were once slaves to sin. This is because our allegiance to sin meant that everything we did was tainted by sin. This is what Paul means in verse 19, where he says, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness. He, Paul, means that, uh, means that we offered us, uh, he, uh, Paul doesn't, doesn't mean that we offer ourselves as a one of sacrifice, that we just do one thing and that's, that's the end of it. R rather, he's saying here that we used to offer every part of our body, everything we did, every uh, part of our body was offered as sacrifice or for, to be used as instruments of wickedness. Imagine that every part of our body is being used as instruments of wickedness. So what does that look like? It's what we watch with our eyes, what we say with our tongue, what we eat with our mouth, what we smell with our nose, what we hear with our ears, what we use our hands for, where our feet takes us. Every aspect of our lives was tainted by sin in how we used to live. There was nothing in us that was free from sin. That is what it means to offer every part of our body as instruments of wickedness. If that is the case, it means that it is impossible impossible to redeem ourselves from sin. But we could not offer any part of our bodies to God as uh, for redemption. We couldn't even offer up our pinky finger to say, I can reserve at least my pinky finger for righteousness. We, could, we couldn't even do that. Everything was controlled by sin. So what could we do? What could we do as people who are slaves to sin? The only thing we could do was to offer ourselves to greater impurity and wickedness on our own. The only thing we could do is to, to sin more and more. Our sin increased more and more because we couldn't stop ourselves. That is what it means to be slaves to sin. That every moment, every thought, everything we did was, to, uh, to be, was used as instruments of sinfulness. There was no godliness or righteousness in us when we were slaves to sin. Not only that, in verse 21, Paul says, so if you look at verse 21, Paul says, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. When we were slaves to sin, we had no idea that what we were doing was wicked. We had no idea that the things that we said, the things that we did, were shameful things. We didn't even know we should be ashamed of those things. Even our thoughts were captive to sin so that we were blind to what we were doing. Only when we were set free did we know that those things were shameful. 
an example that can help us understand what this means is, you know, when you were young, girl, I guess, depending on your age, when you were young or younger, uh, remember, remember the time when you were in your youth, how silly you could be. The things that you did to get a laugh from your mates, right? What would you do? You do very stupid things. And you think it was funny at that time. You think it was the best thing ever to do such things. But in your older age, in your maturity, when you know all the things about life as you do now, and you look back at that time, do you glory in those days of uh, misspent youth? Do you think that was the best time ever because of all the things that, of the stupid things that you did? No, you'd be ashamed of it. You think you'll be cringing and thinking, how did I manage to get myself into those situations? Why did I do those things? I'm so ashamed of, to be, even be a uh, part of those things. To be reminded of things is to be shamed of those, of that time. And, and this is what we were like when we were in slave to sin. As people who have been rescued, when we look back at our, our time, our life of sin or, or, or being slave to sin, we think, how could we do that? How could we be so shameful in disobeying God and promoting our own sinfulness? Knowing what we know in Christ, we can only look back and cringe at our past sinful behavior. But that is not where we are at. In verse 17, Paul begins with, but thanks be to God. Paul thanks God that we didn't remain in our past sinful self. Although we used to be slaves to sin, now we have come to obey from our heart the one who has claimed our allegiance. If we, if we were born as slaves to sin, now we have died and have been raised with Christ to be slaves to God. This means that we are not freed from sin to be our own masters. We have been freed to serve God and obey him only. That is the obedience Paul calls for in verses 16 and 17. Now that we are free from the uh, uh, tyranny of sin, we are now slaves to righteousness. This is our new status in Christ. In Christ, sin is no longer our master. We are freed from sin so that who is our master now? God is our master. So if our God is holy and righteous, if our God, our master, our Lord is holy and righteous, what do you expect our God, our master to command us to do? Would a holy and righteous God command us to do sin? Of course not. If sin commands its slaves to wickedness, then God's servant are to be holy like him. We show we belong to God by, being, by obeying his commands. But then you might ask, what's the difference between servants of God, that is us obeying God, and, and, and obeying the law of Moses as the people of God in the Old Testament. What's the difference? You know, those people in the Old Testament obeyed the law and followed the law of, of Moses. How can we say that they are set free? How we are set free from that to serve God when we are both called to obey God's command? As Paul has shown so far in Romans, the law was only effective in teaching us what sin is. And when we sinned, the law could only condemn us as sinner. So no matter how hard you try to obey the law, no one can be righteous. For as slaves to sin, and as slaves to sin, when we try to obey the law, what does the law say back to us? What does the law say back to us when slaves to, of sin tries to obey the law? The law says, you are a sinner. There is no redemption for you because you, you sin. But being servants of God, as Paul says here in Romans chapter 6, is different. Because we become servants of God, not by our obedience, but by grace. We are declared righteous because of God's grace. If every part of our body was only able to sin, 
then what could we do to please God? Nothing. But by God's grace, we have been set free. It is God's gift that we can now obey him. This is the difference between obedience to the law of Moses and being servants of God by grace. The, for the grace of God has achieved what the obedience to the law could never do. The grace of God has now captured us to be slaves of righteousness. The grace of God has transformed us and transferred us from being slaves to, to sin to become slaves to righteousness. So what does that mean? We obey not to be free from sin, but rather we obey because we are already slaves to God. That is the new status Christ has won for us on the cross. So if that is our new status, then what now? What then is the question that Paul poses? Should we sin because we are free? Of course not. We are free from being slaves to sin, but we are not free from being slaves to God. And as such, we are not free to live our own way. Rather, we are, we are to be righteous as slaves to righteousness. But the question is, how do we do this? How do we live in righteousness? Firstly, by obedience. The fundamental thing about being a slave is to obey your master. That's it, isn't it? If you're a slave and you disobey your master, what can you expect? The only thing you can expect in disobeying your master is reprimand, to be punished for your disobedience. And if our master is the righteous God, then what should we do? What does he expect us to do? We must obey him for the, that is the right thing to do. We should obey and be righteous because we are slaves of God. Secondly, we should offer ourselves to God. That is a one of sacrifice to uh, make ourselves righteous. Rather, we are to offer every part of our body to righteousness. If we are slaves of God, then we must submit to him in everything. Every member of our body, everything that we do in our life must be for him. That's what it means to submit to God. So what we watch, what we eat and taste, what we see and hear, what we hold and where we go, all those things, everything we do must be for God. This is what righteousness leading to holiness means. Righteousness is submitting our lives in obedience to God. Since we are free from slavery to sin, we can now obey God. This is like when Israel left Egypt to worship God. Back in the time when Israel was slaves in Egypt, were they able to get up and go to the mountain of God and worship? They couldn't because Pharaoh would not let them go. While Israel was still slaves in Egypt, they could not go and worship God in the mountain. Only when God freed Israel could they make their way to Mount Sinai to worship him. And that is what we were like. While we were slaves to sin, we could not obey God. But because God set us free in the death of Jesus, we can now obey him. So what should we do now? What should we do now? Simple. Obey God and submit to him in all things. He, by his grace in rescuing us in Christ, we are now able, freed to obey and submit to him. When we were slaves to sin, the only thing we could expect was to taste death and face God's judgment. That is why Paul concludes in verse 23 that, that, the, that the wages of sin is death. The only thing sin can lead us to is death. But the gift of God is different. God's grace leads us to eternal life because it frees us from our bondage to sin. It frees us to become slaves of God. So if God is our master, then what should you and I do in our lives? As slaves, slaves, we must be obedient to our master. Which means that while we are free in Christ, we are not free to sin. We are obligated to obey God because he rescued us to follow him. The benefit of such a life is in direct contrast to the wages of sin. 
The fruit of obedience is holiness that leads to eternal life. But the amazing thing about God's grace is that we are already declared holy and righteous in Christ. We don't have to earn that righteousness. We don't have to earn that right to be slaves or servants of God. Otherwise, how is it God's grace if we have to work to earn our holiness? God's grace means that we are already forgiven. We are already righteous. We already have eternal life promised to us in Christ. That is what our new status in Christ means. To be transferred from being slaves of, of sin to be slaves of God means that all those benefits are ours already. That we are already declared right and holy. That we are already promised eternal life in Christ. Those things are ours already, regardless of what we do right now. But that doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. Because remember, there can only be two masters. Either you are, the sin is your master or God is your master. If God is, if God is not our master, then who is our master? If God is not our master, then sin is our master. And if sin is our master, then there is no holiness or eternal life, is there? If you are still slaves to sin, then you do not have holiness. You do not have eternal life. But if God is our master, then we already have eternal life. So if we have God as our master, then are we free to disobey his commands? And you see why it is more important to consider who our master is rather than whether we are free to do whatever we want. If God is our master, there is only one thing we can do, to obey him and submit to him. If sin is our master, there's only one thing we can do, that is to continue in our life of wickedness. You can't be in both. You can't have two masters. As Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters. Either you serve God or you serve sin. Which is it? Are you free to sin or are you free to serve God? As slaves, we must serve our master. And our master is holy and righteous. And he commands, he commands us to be holy and righteous. So let us flee from temp the temptations of sin. Let us be obedient to God in every aspect of our lives. In everything, let us submit to God, for that is the holiness and righteousness that God has called us to be. Because in Christ, he has already declared us to be righteous. And because God is our master, we must obey what he commands us. Not, do, not return to the mistakes of the past. Not return to sinfulness that we, God has rescued us from. So let's give thanks to God and praise him and honor him in our lives by being obedient to what he commands. As we look forward to the eternal life that he has promised us, our life should be marked by obedience and submission to God, rather than disobedience and wickedness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word and how clear it is in your word that you have called us, rescued us, and saved us for righteousness and not sinfulness. Lord, as we expose more and more sin in our lives, help us to be changed by your word and spirit, that we will oppose sin, that we will flee from sin and turn to you, that we may live our life in obedience to you. Help us to use every member of our body uh, for your glory and honor, that we may submit to you in all things to worship you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's um, continue to honor and praise our God uh, in the second song, in the last song we sing. Uh, consider the words and consider what we just heard about God's grace who has transferred us from being slaves to sin to slaves of righteousness. So let's uh, consider those words, consider those, those thoughts as we uh, sing praises to our God. So let's sing our next song. Okay. Isn't our God great uh, that he has given us this hope of eternal life in Christ? 
that even if we have to wait 10,000 years, we will still wait in hope uh, because God's promises are sure. His blessings are good for us. So why don't we pray to him uh, in thanksgiving for all the blessings that he has given to us, especially in his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your precious gift of your son. Thank you so much that his death means, meant life for us and his resurrection has given us new hope, a living hope into eternal life, that when he returns, we are assured to be raised up with him, to be with, with him in heaven for all eternity. So thank you, so, Lord, so much for the blessings and the rich blessings that you have given to us in Christ. We have not earned it, but you have give, given it to us as a gift. And, and so, Lord, the only thing that we can offer back to you is our thankfulness. And Lord, we also pray, um, also in our thankfulness, we offer up our um, offerings to you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that the collection that we collect this morning and over time will be used for your glory and honor. Lord, we pray that your church will be, be diligent uh, in how we use uh, your blessings uh, so that we may glorify and honor you, not just in our church, uh, but in our wider community as well. Help us, Lord, to honor you in everything that we do uh, in, in, in our church. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we consider who we are, uh, let's make, make sure that we are living our life in, in the, over the next week as people of God, as slaves to God, to, in obedience to what he commands us. Uh, so let's uh, say the grace together in conclusion. Um, yep, here we go. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.